Hello there everyone and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today is the day. Today we get to talk about everyone's favorite topics. It's math and data. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Now it won't be that bad, but fair warning, there is a lot of content in this video. Throughout this video, we are going to be reviewing all the major concepts that you need to know for Unit 1, Topic 5, Statistical Analysis in Psychology. Researchers use statistical analysis to better understand the data they've collected during their studies. And when collecting data and analyzing data, we can see researchers use quantitative data and also qualitative data. Quantitative data is numbers, facts, information that's not up for interpretation. For example, if you took AP Human Geography, you heard me talk about both of these types of data. And you know that quantitative data can come from the U.S. Census and is information like the population of a city or the medium income of a town. All these numbers are facts and they're not up for interpretation or debate. Up next is qualitative data, which often comes in word form and comes from surveys, interviews. This is up for interpretation. Qualitative data describes qualities or characteristics of something. For example, how would you rate the food at your school or how good of a job do you think the president is doing? And since we're on the topic of organizing data, let's talk about descriptive statistics and also inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics is when researchers organize and describe data. Here researchers are describing the data that is collected. While inferential statistics is when researchers make predictions about their data and independent variables. Inferential statistics help researchers determine if the data from a sample can be applied to a population. When using descriptive statistics, we often see researchers use a frequency distribution table. This allows them to be able to see how often sets of data occur. For example, when looking at this frequency distribution table, Table, which is displaying quiz scores, I can see that three students got a six, one student got a 10, and two students got a five. Researchers will also utilize a frequency polygram, which is a visual representation of a frequency distribution table. This highlights different connections between points on a scatter plot. Another tool that can be used is a histogram. This is another way in which researchers display data. Histograms are bar graphs that show frequencies through vertical columns. These are very similar to bar graphs, however, there is a key difference, and that's the fact that in a histogram, the bars are not separated by space, while a bar graph does have space between each of the bars. Lastly, researchers could display data in a pie chart, where data is divided up into different sections of a circle, each representing a portion of the whole. All right, so we've spent some time now talking about categorizing data and displaying data, but we need to get into the real fun now, and that's the math part. Once researchers have organized their data, they need to summarize it, and it starts with the mode, medium, and mean, also known as the central tendency. The mean is the average of the data set. To find this, you would take the sum of all of your values and divide them by the amount of values that you added together. To find the mode, you want to look for the value that occurs most often. Whichever value occurs the most, that's the mode. Lastly, for the median, you want to find the score that the exact middle of the data set. To find the median, you need to organize your data in order from smallest to largest. If you have an odd amount of values, you take the value that is in the middle. And if you have an even amount of values, you take the two values in the middle, add them together, and divide by two. All right, let's see if this is making sense to you. Take five seconds. If you need more time, you can always pause the video. and answer the questions on the screen. And that's time. To check your answers, go down to the comment section of this video. There you'll be able to see my math along with the answers to the questions. Also, while you're down there, don't forget to hit subscribe and also like the video. It's free and it lets me know that you want more AP Psychology content. So the central tendency does a great job at providing us with a snapshot of the data that was collected. But we really can't gauge how the data is dispersed. To do that, we need to look at the measures of variability, which is range and standard deviation. To calculate the range, you need to take the highest value point and the lowest value point and subtract them. Range is just the difference between the two points. For example, if we go back to our original set of data, the highest value is 210 and the lowest is 95, so our range is 115. Standard deviation, on the other hand, allows researchers to indicate the average distance from the mean for a data set. For AP Psychology, you don't have to worry about having to calculate the standard deviation. When looking at the standard of deviation, we can see a couple different distributions occur. Sometimes we might have a normal distribution. This takes the shape with a symmetrical bell-shaped curve. Here we have just one mode, and the mean and median and the mode are all located at the center of the distribution, at the zero point value. Now, a normal distribution is not the most common frequency distribution. It's much more common that data sets will have a positive skew or a negative skew. A positive skew occurs when scores are low and are clustered to the left of the mean, while a negative skew has higher scores that are clustered on the right of the mean. You also might see a bimodal distribution, which is when a distribution has two modes, causing the distribution to have two peaks. Now, while you might not have to calculate the standard deviation, you do need to be 
be able to understand what it means and to be able to analyze different distributions and data. In a normal distribution, on average, 68% of scores will fall within one standard deviation of the mean in each direction. 95% of scores will fall within two standard deviations of the mean in each direction. And 99% of scores will fall within three standard deviations of the mean in both directions. Now, you'll also need to understand the Z scores and the percentiles as well. A Z score is a numerical measurement that describes how many standard deviations a particular score is away from the mean. We can see in a normal distribution, a positive Z score is higher than the mean, and a negative Z score indicates it's lower than the mean. Generally, Z scores allow us to compare things that are not the same as long as they're normally distributed. Understanding the Z scores and the standard deviation is something you'll definitely want to make sure you know how to do. Next thing you want to remember is percentile rank. This is the percentage of scores at or below a particular score. Essentially, this tells you what percentage of the population has a score or value that's the same or lower than yours. This can be calculated in a normal distribution. When looking at the percentile rank, remember that the median is the 50th percentile. This has half the data above and half the data below the median. So for example, if you're in the 73rd percentile for height, that means that 73% of the people your age have heights that are less than or equal to yours. 73% of the distribution will be the left of your height. It also means that 27% of the people your age have the same height or are taller than you. All right, let's practice this and see if this is making sense to you. Take five seconds and answer the questions on the screen. If you need more time, pause the video. And there you go, that's time. Hopefully your head is not spinning. To check your answers, go down to the comment section of this video and look for my answers on the top. All right, so we're on to the last two topics of this video, which are some fun coefficients and p-values. Now, when we're talking about coefficients, we need to go back to correlational studies. Remember, these studies seek to determine the relationship between two different variables. Correlations allow us to make predictions on what will happen, but they do not show causation. When analyzing the results of a correlational study, you'll look at the correlational coefficients. The closer the value is to one, whether it be positive or negative, the stronger the relationship is between the two variables. If the correlational coefficient is between zero and one, that means the variables are either increasing or decreasing together. If we plot the data on a scatter plot, a positive relationship would look like this. But if a correlation coefficient is between zero and negative one, it means one variable increases while the other decreases. This is an inverse relationship or also a negative relationship. If we plotted this on a scatter plot, it would look like this. And if there is no correlation, it means there's no relationship between the two different variables. And when plotted on a scatter point, the data points would be all over the place. And of course, when Whenever we are looking at data or studies, we have to ask ourselves, did we get this outcome by chance? And that's where the probability value comes in. This value tells us if the data collected from our sample group can be applied to the population. If P, the probability value, is less than or equal to 0.05, the results are statistically significant, which means the results of the study were most likely not caused by chance or luck. The p-value can be anything between 0 and 1, and the p-value shows the strength of the evidence. The smaller the p-value is, the stronger the evidence is against the null hypothesis. And the more likely it is that the results are statistically significant. For example, let's say we had a p-value of 0 0.90. This would mean there's a 90% chance that the results of our experiment were due to chance. So we can see that these results are not statistically significant. Remember, the lower the p-value, the more likely it is that the null hypothesis is wrong, and the more likely it is that our independent variable caused the dependent variable. And just like that, we are on to the practice quiz. See, the math wasn't too bad. Take some time now and answer the questions on the screen, and check your answers in the comment section down below. Also, don't forget to check out the Mr. Sin Discord for more help and also to subscribe and like the video. As always, I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, I'll see you guys online.